And um, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank You for this day and we thank You for Jesus Christ. Lord, we don't even know what we mean when we speak of Him. The glory and majesty which He had with You before the foundation of the world, His emptying, His humiliation, and now seated at Your right hand. Father, thank You. And thank You for the grace that has drawn us to Christ, for the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit, for making us captive. Lord, thank You. If it was not for grace, we would have no hope. But there is hope. You're a good God. A strong tower. The righteous run in and are safe. Thank You, Lord, and help us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now it says also that all things have been created through Him. All things have been created uh, through Him. There is a sense in which He's the mediator also of, of every everything. The Father created the world through Him. The Father revealed Himself to the world through Him. The Father redeemed the world through Him. The Father will judge the world through Him. The Father sustains the world through Him. I think you can see that Christ is quite the important figure, not only in human history, but in everything that God has ever done. Now, it says the writer of Hebrews explains this text when he writes that the Son was the agent or instrument through whom God the Father made the world. However, it is important to understand that the Son was not an inferior agent, but a co-equal agent with the Father in creation. Now, do you understand that? He's not just an instrument as a man might use a hoe, the hoe being inferior to the man himself. He was not just a tool, but he was a co-equal agent with the Father. Equal to the Father in every way. And this is proven by John when he says, All things came into being through Him, that is the Son, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Now, Charles Spurgeon writes, How can anyone ever read this passage and yet say that Jesus Christ is only a man? It's absolutely impossible. By what twisting of words can such language as this be applied to the most eminent prophet or apostle who ever lived? They cannot be. Surely He must be God by whom all things were created and by whom all things consist. Now, not only in this world not only in this material world, but in the spiritual. He says both in the heavens and on earth. Edie writes, Christ's creative work has no local or limited operation. It was not bounded by this little orb. Its sweep surrounds the universe. Every form and kind of matter, simple or complex, the atom and the star, the sun and the cloud, every grade of life from the worm to the angel, every order of intellect and being around and above us, the splendors of heaven and the near phenomenon of earth are all the products of the firstborn. You want to be amazed sometimes at the power of Jesus Christ? Then just study up on your astronomy. Just look at the most recent and far-reaching photos from the most modern satellites. Just look at what lays out there. A friend of mine, Charles Leiter, just sent me a montage of, of new uh, photographs from space. It's absolutely astounding. I mean, if you were to take... I mean, the smallest living organism, the most simple living organism, organism on this planet, we cannot even begin to fathom how it was made, how it came into being. We can't even fathom it. And yet worlds 
without end He has created. And then He was sitting on a well among the Samaritans and said, I thirst. Give me something to drink. I mean, you, you know, we talk about eternity as being beyond the, the comprehension of, of a man's mind, and that is true. But if you just look at astronomy, it goes beyond... A, a man literally could go mad in astronomy. When you think of the size and the complexity of everything around us. And then, what always amazed me is that if you go out into space, it goes on and on and on and on and on and on, thousands upon thousands of millions of light years, on and on and on, outward. Next question. How far does it go inward? If you keep going out, you can keep going in. Smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And yet Christ, the One who died for you, the One who washed the disciples' feet is the one who did this and sustains it. If the whole universe was a supercomputer, a supercomputer the size of the universe could not bring together and hold together the complexities, even to understand them. It's just phenomenal. And this is the one who was born in a manger. Now, it says visible and invisible. All creation owes its existence to the sun, the material, physical realm of men and the immaterial, spiritual realm of angels. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, this is a reference to, a, to heaven's angelic hierarchy. The highest ruling angels and the most splendid creatures owe their very existence to the eternal Son of God. He is their maker, sustainer, and absolute sovereign. Now, you think about this. Creatures that we know almost nothing about. But we would assume, to some degree, that their splendor, their beauty, and power would almost dissolve us. And yet all of them, the host of them, possibly almost an infinite number of them, were all created, sustained by Christ, and they exist to serve and worship Christ. Here's a good question. Does Jesus really need the worship of men? And would He really be lonely? If none of us accepted Him, would it be that great a loss? He has worlds unnumbered. So people always ask me, do, they, do you think there's life somewhere else other than this planet? I say, oh, of course there is. It's in the Bible. You say, you know, what are you talking about? Ezekiel and the scroll? And the... No, it's in the Bible. They're called angels. There's no telling what's out there, guys. There's no telling what's out there. See, men with tight spirits, narrow minds, and dull hearts, we should not be that kind of man. One of the things I love about Angel Comenares in Peru is um, he's a missionary. God's used him in many, many great ways. <clears throat> he goes to the jungle. He brings back plants. And he'll just sit there and look at them. Talk about them. Look them up in books. He'll bring back wakos, which are an ancient relics that maybe are found somewhere up in the mountains. He talks about stars and space. He's a... Uh, uh, he's a man who was high school education, been to a Bible institute, very rural, third world, third world country, very rural, knows very little, but just marvels, marvels at everything. 
Let me ask you, do you marvel enough? Do you marvel at anything? Is there any wonder? My little boy, Evan, uh, two nights ago, for some reason, just started crying and he said, I want to go visit Nana. Nana was my mother. And I said, well, Evan, you know that she's, she died. And she's in heaven. Well, is she happy? Oh, yes, she is very happy. Well, what's she doing? So we just sat down for a while and tried to imagine some of the things that she was doing. Well, she's worshiping Jesus. She's, she's serving the Lord. Is she flying? Can she fly? <laughs> and I said, you know, I really don't know, but I, I bet she can. Does she swim? Can she swim with the fish? And I said, well, I don't know, but if there's fish up there, I'm sure she can swim with them. Even sharks, too. Can she swim with sharks? Well, if there's sharks up there, I bet they're friendly. Now, you think, well, you're making up stuff. Maybe, but here's the thing. Have you never sa- Do you no longer sit down and wonder what's up there? Do you no longer just sit and think about what's waiting for you? People who have no wonder in their life should never get up in a pulpit. There's no childlike amazement. Nothing amazes you anymore. Don't get up in a pulpit. John Eady writes, The object of the apostle is to show that Jesus is the Creator, not simply of lower modes of being, but the higher essences of the universe. Yes, those being so illustrious as to be seated on thrones, so noble as to be style, styled dominions, so elevated as to be greeted with the title of principalities, and so mighty as to merit the appellation of powers, these so like God as to be called gods themselves, Psalms 97.7, bow to the Son of God as the one author of their existence, position, and prerogative. No atom is too minute, so no creature is too gigantic for His plastic hand. You say, plastic? That word literally, the, the older use of that word is creative. His creative hand. And I think that, you know, if you notice, I've, I've quoted Edie quite a bit on this part. In, in Colossians, he's absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. Now, in him all things hold together. And I, I love this part. I just because it, it actually reminds me so much of the Christian life. There's so much in creation that reminds us of the salvation of his people. He created, he called light out of darkness. He recreated us, regenerated us, calling light out of darkness. He sustains creation so that it doesn't fall apart. He sustains us with His grace so that we do not fall away. Now, it says, In Him all things hold together. The phrase hold together is derived from a Greek word which means to place together, to cohere, or to hold together. All creation is held together by the Son. You see, He didn't just... You don't just create things and then by their own nature and their own power, they then keep themselves together. He not only creates, but He holds together what He creates. He not only makes it happen, putting planets in orbit and everything else, but He must sustain them in their orbit. There's not some force He's tapped into that allows them to flow on their own. You're amazed that He created the world? He created the universe. You ought to be. But there's something even greater to keep all these complexities going is astounding. And then He can't take care of you. He can take care of you. But I'll tell you this, I've been walking with the Lord a lot. And I don't mean that as far as in greatness, but I mean that as far as been a lot of years. And you know what? In a recent trial I was passing through, and still passing through, 
I was laying there. I woke up at night. And now nah, it wasn't a voice. And it definitely wasn't God. But a thought <coughs> came into my head so clear. And it was this. He doesn't even know what you're going through. I mean, just the thought. wasn't a voice. wasn't something. But just the thought came into my head. He doesn't know what you're going through. I mean, so much stuff. A feeling of just lostness coming over you. Like, if that's true, there's... But it's not true. And that's what we call the fiery darts of the devil and holding up the shield of faith. He does know. He is that big. He is that big. That's why it's so important to study the attributes of God. Now, all creation is held together by the Son. He is the great Creator and the great Conserver. His importance to the universe was not momentary. Now, this is very important because a lot of more liberal persuasions will say that they believe that God created the universe but then left it. But His, His importance to the universe was not momentary but constant. He is the moment-by-moment moment sustainer. Now look at that. He's the moment-by-moment moment sustainer. And yet, look at this. I mean, if you know, it'd be a hard day at the office if for eight hours you had to sustain the universe. You come home, you'd say, Honey, I don't want to go out tonight with our friends. I'm pretty tired. I'm pretty wore out. Can I just take a bath? Soak there for a while? Maybe veg out a little? He sustains the entire universe moment by moment throughout all of eternity without effort. Without effort. Lord, what are you going to do today? Oh, I'm going on vacation. All I'm going to do is sustain the entire universe. I mean, think about I mean, we're not talking about... We, we're not even talking about concepts of power anymore. This goes outside of any calculation or definition of power because it, it, there's no exertion. I mean, how does he do this? We all know of the mythological atlas balancing the, just the globe on his shoulders, groaning under the curse, under the judgment. We think so mighty atlas that he holds up the world. Jesus is holding up everything. And it's lighter than a feather to him. Now that's power. All creation exists in utter and total dependence upon the Son. That is why those who would tr seek to make themselves independent of the Son is like a person on a life support system that the moment he wakes up, he's trying to rip the plug out of the wall. Everything exists in total dependence on the Son. It will never wean itself away from Him. Now think about that. Here's the thing that... Let me discuss this with you for a moment. My boys were weaned. My daughter was weaned. My boys, little by little, are learning so as to one day even be weaned from the authority of their father and their mother. I mean, I hold the hands of both my boys when we're walking through the Walmart parking lot. I hope not to do that when they're 16. <laughs> Okay, this is very important, isn't it? So there's a sense in which in human relationships we desire as people grow to maturity that they break off in their dependence and they become autonomous in a sense. But the Christian life is not that way. You do, your, your maturity is not manifested by greater independence. Your maturity is manifested by greater dependence. Do you see that? Greater dependence. 
So the more that you grow in Him, you're becoming more and more dependent upon the Lord. That's why many times younger ministers can actually be more useful than those with experience. And that is why many times the older prophets become useless and dangerous. You see, you talk to a missionary. I'll never forget Homer Crane. I just dearly love that man. And, and his wife went home to be with the Lord last year. Homer was a missionary in Peru. I used to call him the John Wayne of missions. This is the toughest bird you've ever seen in your life. And he could not speak Spanish very well. I mean, even when I knew him. Now, he could preach. Man, when he started preaching, something happened because then his Spanish got a lot better. But he told me he was up in Wong, it was either Wan, I think it was Wanako or Wankayo, I believe it was Wanako, up in the mountains where you can see the stars. In his first sermon in Spanish, he said, Paul, all I could say was the heavens declare the glory of God, look at the stars. And now Homer was sovereign grace and was not an easy believism preacher. You can count on that. But he told me, he said, 30-some 30, 30 people seemed to be soundly converted that night. And he said, I'd never seen that before or after in my ministry. And I said, Homer, then why? Never called him Homer, called him Brother Crane. Why? He said, because I absolutely was more dependent upon God than ever in my life. I knew I couldn't speak. Homer knew he could preach. Homer can preach. He's a gifted preacher in English. But he was so limited that he had to throw himself just on the power of God. Okay? One of the problems is sometimes we get into this thing that I'm experienced and I'm mature and this and that and we become fools. We become fools. True maturity manifests itself in a greater dependence. We don't wean ourself away from Him. Have you ever noticed that most of the men in the Bible, when they really fell, they didn't fall when they were a young minister? <coughs> when they were full of zeal? They fell when they were older? When they had some victories under their belt? <coughs> and began to think that maybe they didn't need to, they were wiser than they used to be? Be very, very careful. Very careful. Especially if you get some victories under your belt. Why? David, no, didn't, he should have been going out there fighting with the kings. He's walking on his roof. Noah, great victory, then falls. Be very, very, very careful. Very careful. And just because a man is young does not mean he's unwise. And just because he's inexperienced doesn't mean he's a fool. That's very important. So when you get to be an older preacher, don't despise younger preachers by making blanket statements about them that aren't necessarily true. Because I know some young men much younger than me that are also wiser than me. It doesn't. If you're old, it doesn't mean you're wise. If you're young, it doesn't mean you're stupid. Although there are a lot of stupid young people and a lot of unwise and wise older people. Just remember that. God put Spurgeon in the pulpit when he was 19. That's a phenomenal thing. Probably rarely repeated, but he did. A young person can come into your ministry that, that maybe even you've established, that God used you to establish that ministry, and God may want to turn it over to him. So always be careful. Always be cautious. Now, the writer of Hebrews tells us that He upholds all things by the word of His power. The power and glory of the Son is such that He upheld and upholds the existence of all things by one command of His mouth. He is not like the mythological Atlas who groans under the weight of a single world, but the Son upholds countless worlds and all their inhabitants with the ease of a single word. He created all things with a word and He sustains all things with the same. Adam, I mean, here's Atlas groaning with all these big muscles and Jesus is just going, stay up. Sustains everything with a word. You know, we say a word is very light. Not in this case. Not in this case. 
I mean, I mean, it is going to take eternities just to even make it to the foothills of the knowledge of God. Albert Barnes writes, the meaning is that they are kept in the present state, their existence, order, and arrangement are continued by His power. If unsupported by Him, they would fall into disorder or sink back to nothing. If this be the proper interpretation, then it is the ascription to Christ of infinite power. For nothing less could be sufficient to uphold the universe and of infinite wisdom, for this is needed to preserve the harmonious actions, action of the suns and systems of which it is composed. None could do this but one who is divine. And hence we see the reason why he is represented as the image of the invisible God. He is the great and glorious and ever active agent by whom the perfections of God are made known. Him. And then Manton writes, He is not the bare instrument of God in sustaining the creature, but as a co-equal agent. As He made the world, and with the Father created all things, so He doth support and order all things. It is as well the work of the Son as of the Father. For He is God, equal with Him in glory and power. My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. John 5.17 And He hath a command of all the creatures that they can do nothing without Him, how much soever they attempt to do against Him. Look, they can do nothing without Him even though they attempt to do everything against Him. Do you realize what's amazing? When men fight, you know, he talks about, he even uses the wrath of God for His praise. I mean, the wrath of men for His praise. When men fight against God. They do so by the power of God. Now think about this. You know, you got to know you can't win. When you're fighting against Him by the power He gives you. So all He has to do is stop the flow of power and you're gone. I mean, it, it's amazing how foolish men are. And see... We think men are going to see their foolishness by some kind of intellectual argument we win. No. What you've got to do to show men their foolishness is show them who God is and their dependence upon Him. That's what you have to do. Just look at this, sir. You're fighting against God. You're, you're actually clenching your fist in the face of God and you're doing so by the power of God and the grace of God. And if it wasn't for Him, you wouldn't even be able to twist your lips in anger against Him. It's absolutely amazing. Absolutely. Let's look at what John Eady says here uh, up in the um, section that's marked off the glory of the Son in creation. Had the divine being remained alone, His glory would have been unseen and His praises unsung. But He longed to impart of His own happiness to creatures fitted to possess it to fill so many vessels out of that foundation of life which wells out from His bosom. Therefore, Christ fitted up these all things for Himself in order that He might exhibit His glory while He diffused happiness through creatures of innumerable worlds and enabled them to uphold His mirrored brightness and reflect it, that He might occupy a throne of supreme and unapproachable sovereignty and show to the universe His indescribable grace which in stooping to save one of its worlds was, has thrown a new luster over the divine holiness and proved the unshakable harmony and stability of the divine administration. Now, you could spend all day there. But that's go back to something that we shared when we first began here, that for God to do everything for His own glory is for God to find the greatest benefit for His creature. See, people have a problem a lot of times. Well, man, if God does everything for His own glory, is that very loving? Well, <clears throat> the greatest kindness that God could ever show you is by giving you the greatest gift. The greatest gift He could ever give you is to take center stage, do everything to reveal His glory so that you could see it. 
for you to witness and behold Him in His beauty and His power and all His attributes. For Him to arrange and order the worlds so that He could reveal Himself to you is the greatest gift He could ever give you. Uh, Piper uses this word sometimes. It's an old word. But to be, be besought is just to be a sense of saturated, enamored by God. Now, why do so few people in the pew, why are they, it seems that they want so little of God? It's not just because some are unconverted. One of the reasons is we give them so little of God. It is, you know, again, let, let's just go back again to, he's just a man, but let's just go back for a moment to Dr. Piper. What, what's unique there? Now, I don't agree with with everything. You don't ever agree with everything about a man, but what, what is so unique about his ministry? His desire that God be revealed so that men would just delight in God. You want, let's say you're pastoring a church and, and people just aren't motivated. So how are you going to motivate them? Get a program, a plan, a scheme? Promise them 6,000 crowns in glory if they'll do something? Soul winner's crown, this crown, that crown, every kind of crown? Or should you just seek to study until your heart, your own heart, preacher, is warmed by the things you've learned of God and then go out there with a warm heart and share those things? You see, the overflow of what you've studied. And there's so much in a text. I mean that literally if you... <coughs> If you have the chance to study a text for 25 hours, small you know, four verses, 25 hours, you it'll take it'll take four hours to preach what you got there. I mean, it just I, no matter how fast you talk. I mean, it's inexhaustible if you're doing the text. If you're doing the text. If you just use the text as a jump off or starting point for something else, then yeah, you're going to be doing pretty bad. But if you just use the text, you can't even begin to do... Do you know you could spend your entire life on John 3.16? You could. You know you could spend your entire life on Psalms 23. Heard of a, a fella who reads the Scripture quite a bit, seeks to memorize Scripture, but he, he thought to himself one day, you know, I'm going to take one passage of Scripture and just make it my lifelong passage. I'm going to study the whole Bible and everything, but I'm going to meditate on one passage all my life. Kind of separate it. And he chose Psalms 23. And it's amazing. You know, you sit there and you go, okay, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The. The. It's a definite article. It's not an indefinite article. Do you realize how long you could preach that? How far you could go? The Lord. Not a Lord. The Lord. Right there you've got holiness. Uniqueness. Otherness. No one is like the Lord. I mean, it would just go on forever. The Lord. Real sovereignty. I mean, do you see what's going on now? The Lord is ever present tense. Always that He is. He just is. Changes everything because if He was not, everything would be different. But He is, so everything's not different. Changes everything. The mere fact that He is. Now let's spend about three or four years there. The Lord is my shepherd. 
Not just yours, not just the shepherd of history, not just the shepherd of the universe, not just the shepherd of some macrocosm, no, of me, my shepherd, personal. Shepherd. I mean, do you see? And so when you're preaching and you're, you're thinking, you know, the people just aren't excited about Christ, maybe it's a, a reflection on us. Maybe it's a reflection on us. Are you excited about Christ? Now, don't run out here and pump yourself up like you're getting ready to go to a football game. That's just enthusiasm. Fleshly excitement. Study deep. Drink deep from the Scripture's revelation of the person of Christ. And you won't have to get motivated. You really won't. Alright, well, let's... Uh, Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray that You would use this time for Your glory and Your honor. Help Your people. In Jesus' name.